Cool. Can everyone everyone hear us? Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm David Wise. I'm the art director here at MFG.World, a multidisciplinary creative practice based in Orem, Utah. Uh, I'm Maureen. I'm a graphic designer at MF9World. And um, we're excited to kick off the first annual Ellipsis Lecture Series um, here with Christian Henson. Um, after the talk, we'll have like a brief Q&A. Um, so please DM, DM us like your questions and we'll field them and kind of organize them for after the lecture. Um, before Christian starts, I want to kind of give a brief introduction to those that might not be familiar with him or his practice. Uh, Christian Henson is a designer, director, and publisher based in Muntinlupa, uh, Philippines, with a BFA from Art Center and an MFA from Yale School of Art. After an early career of designing for LA-based brands and music labels, he moved to New York City to focus on working in collaboration with artists, photographers, and art institutions with a primary focus on the Philippines and the Filipino diaspora. In 2013, he co-founded the publishing and print Hardworking Good Looking with Clara uh, Balaguer as a means of researching and circulating concepts such as social practice, art making, decolonization, vernacular typography, cyber folkways, and third cinema studies, as well as local print culture. Hardworking Good Looking has evolved into a wider collective that now includes artists and designers, uh, Sar Christoph and Dante Carlos. Their work has been featured in a range of talks, workshops, and residencies and spaces such as the Walker Art Center, Swiss Institute, Print of Matter, the um, Guangzhou Biennale, and more. I personally first encountered Christian's work um, from a material standpoint when he and Clara were participating in a residency at Ulysses, um, a project in community space located in Philadelphia, PA. Um, after seeing their work and the activation of that space um, through the residency, um, not to mention the numerous publications and, um, and artworks and projects that have been produced since then, it was clear that ideas of care, partnership, and specifically community um, were at the center. Um, and with that said, we're more than thrilled to have Christian Henson here tonight to talk a little bit more about his practice through the lens of current events and the sort of ramifications of and the intersection of designs within these current events. Um, so without further ado, uh, Christian. Um, hi everyone, can, can everyone see me or I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, hi, oh, here we are. there I am. <laughs> hi everyone. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm just like really excited to kind of uh, sort of show this new lecture I've been planning. And um, it's sort of kind of a mix between a culmination of like a lot of features I've done over the year and it kind of all leading up to this one direction and also something new in terms of uh, focusing on architecture. Let me, let me actually, should I um, uh, share my screen? Um, so yeah, um, I think you gave a pretty good <laughs> intro um, already in, ter in terms of, uh, of my biography. But again, uh, the lecture I'm gonna give today is called Edifice Complex, A Brief History of Philippine Brutalism and Decolonial Design During Martial Law, uh, again, for Ellipsis Annual Lecture Series by uh, MFG. Um, and so, yeah, I, I guess, I guess like, like many people, so I just moved back to the Philippines uh, about a year ago, and I would say I wouldn't really ex wasn't really expecting um, the election to turn out the way it was. And I've been sort of, even maybe six months prior in, in the way that um, uh, Bong Bong Marcos, who's like uh, Ferdinand Marcos's um, son, uh, I. He was leading in the polls in such a way I was like kind of mentally preparing for this thing to happen, but with also <laughs> maintaining a glimmer of hope that maybe the opposition, Lenny Robredo, could come through. But here we are. And I think it's even important, more important now to actually talk more directly about the history uh, of what happened during martial law, what um, his, um, his father, uh, Ferdinand Marcos, uh, did during this time. And 
because you know we are designers, I think primarily here, I think that's what who's in the room. Um, that I think that uh, you know how how as a designer are we uh, how do we interface with that? What is our complicity in that? Uh, what are tools that we can do at least in terms of like addressing it or uh, confronting it rather than simply you know as you know now people just cancel things or just look the other way or or boycott. I think we need to interact and interface with uh, people who support um, uh, fascism <laughs> or neo-fascism in a way, and, and but in a way that's more um, uh, I don't know, more, much more level and not just like getting into a shouting match or something. I don't know if that's going to happen with this, but I think within just looking at the sort of architectural history of the Philippines leading up until uh, martial law, I think at least it sort of sort of illustrates the history. So. Um, let's see here. So yeah, I've been thinking about uh, architecture a lot, and also in the way that it kind of reflects uh, part of my own biography. And as mentioned, I went to Col Art Center College of Design in Pasadena, and you know this 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 building by um, by Craig Elwood, um, sort of this uh, this is the classic sort of uh, high modernist aesthetic, typically using steel and glass as like sort of one of the uh, sort of identifying factors of that. And I feel very, uh, I get good feelings when I, when I see this building, because I, I, I went, I, even before going there for, for undergrad, I, I went there for high school, for summer school. Um, so I spent a lot of time in this building, learning about design, like learning about what design is. And I think that it, it definitely did shape my, my outlook and also my response to it. I guess my sort of, in previous lectures and, and, and Everyone knows my attitude as sort of this like love-hate relationship with modernism. And then, um, let's see, that's it not, okay. And then in, in graduate school, I went to, uh, to Yale. Uh, the, sadly, the School of Design, <laughs> of graphic design is not within this amazing Buddhist building by um, Paul, uh, Paul, Paul, Paul Rudolph, <laughs> which is designed for the architecture school. But actually this is, other than some state buildings was the first sort of um, brutalist building that I uh, uh, ever really sort of entered. And they have an amazing design library within this space. And I took a few classes in here. Um, I've been onto the rooftop and just sort of seeing like the inner working of, these, of, of a brutalist structure. Um, and I'll get more into like sort of the definitions of brutalism later. But also, you know, after after Yale, after living in New Haven, I lived in Brooklyn a long time, and this is my the last project um, that I worked on there for Powerhouse Arts. Um, this is a building uh, by Herzog Demiron, where um, they sort of it was a mix between uh, sort of renovating or like overhauling an existing building uh, on the right, which was uh, uh, sort of. I don't want to go into the lengthy history of this building, but essentially it was an artist uh, squat, an artist commune for a long time in New York and has its own history. And it was actually, I can't believe they covered the graffiti. Um, they weren't supposed to do that, but it used to be covered in graffiti. And um, and so they wanted the, the, the people behind Power Arts wanted to sort of save it. And then sort of Herzog Demeron kind of built this uh, volume to the left of it, sort of over the footprint of the old. Um, here's some of the uh, schematics of that. And, but sadly, because of COVID, um, this project was put on hold in terms of like my involvement, in terms of the, the identity, um, this is the identity I worked on. And which kind of like led me to think that, you know, moving back to the Philippines, uh, my, my wife already kind of planning to, um, was they made that decision that we were gonna make much, much, much easier. Um, and in addition to this building, which is, this is a rendering, this is not the actual building, um, but this is a, a, a Strand Busai, um, who, who, this is a current project I'm working on in terms of an identity with uh, Aya Maceda and James Karsh of Allow Design, who are, um, Aya is Filipina, but based in um, Brooklyn, and James is based in New Orleans, and we've been sort of building up this identity based on the Strand, the strand comes from this like concept of, uh, of a strands within a weave and, and weaving is, is a, a deep part of Filipino tradition. And so the identity sort of echoes that as well as the, the architecture. 
And so, yeah, this is like currently in uh, the works. Um, but this, it, this is sort of interesting because it sort of also echoes um, Aya's and my own like um, sort of decolonial thoughts about bringing in indigenous elements into the design. I mean, as you can see here, sorry, um, I'm going too fast, but um, uh, different uh, indigenous weaving patterns are, are sort of woven into the uh, the flooring of of the of the of the complex, uh, which you can't really see um, from the ground level, but you'll be able to see if you were to fly a drone. Um, and, I, and I could go into much more detail, but this sort of just a way of outlining like sort of my history within architecture. Um, and there's some identity work for that project and which will also lead to um, outward communications and such like the concept of the strand. Um, But what I'm most known for is a publishing house I started as mentioned with Clara Balaguer and later in, in collaboration with Dante Carlos and uh, Zara Kristoff, uh, hardworking, good looking. Um, as mentioned, I, I did a lot of branding work and commercial work um, before and uh, after grad school really wanted to, yeah, delve into art, art and uh, design in the Philippines in some way and um, and, 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 and I thought that like, the best way is to, to do it through publications because uh, it is hard to, a lot of our history isn't really documented um, or the, just in the way things are um, circulated, it's really hard to, at least especially in the, the Philippine diaspora, um, to acquire content about the Philippines or content about the Philippines that has a more uh, street level grassroots um, type of, uh, Perspective. <laughs> Sorry, it's a little early. Um, and we did a host of things, uh, and primarily I, I was inspired by uh, Clara's project, Office of Culture and Design, and they were doing a lot of social practice artwork and and um, and, and things within the community, and also interface. Inter I'm trying to base this all around architecture, but interfacing with Manila, especially with this is one of our first projects, um, which dealt with psychogeography. In Manila, through through um, plant life and the, the plants you find on the street, to kind of as a, a mode of mapping. Um, but we also hosted later on, as I came on office for design, like hosted residencies, and we would take those residencies and create publications from them. So it was, on one way, a publishing house and um, and about uh, and about a design studio, but it was also very performative in, in the way that we sort of acted as like. Uh, some sort of art center in a way of like bringing people to collaborate or um, this is uh, one of our last publications scenes of production of like creating a collective within the art communities here with, in this case photography. Um, uh, also was the news for me to publish some of my own research that I've been doing. This is um, a, a research project with my brother who's on the left there who is this like crusty crust punk kid in LA who like later on moved to the Philippines because of um, uh, a medical, mental medical condition, but it was a way for me to kind of study anarchy, anarchism and um, like sort of crust punk aesthetics, but through his record collection. Um, and, I, and I started this project much earlier, but being here and starting this publishing house and how um, accessible and affordable um, uh, uh, the printing is here, allowed me to print this. Um, and I think it sort of establishes like a kind of uh, a way I like to operate or a way I like to study. Um, I was already thinking of, uh, of going through my brother's record collection that he left in LA as sort of being an archeologist in some way of like, like, you know, maybe someone finds a Mayan ruin or something and they're doing <laughs> rubbings and collecting clay pots and such, but these were, my, my artifacts that I was sort of leafing through and without context and knowing the music, but I'm not a super fan, sort of understanding him through um, these objects, this, these materials. Um, so I'm just gonna leave through that. Um, and I even like sort of <laughs> dabbled into playing with the sort of black metal uh, crust typography for hard work and good looking. Um, 
And we also hosted the, but also as a means of uh, later on, especially like hosting workshops, attending workshops. Um, it was a very, very uh, hardworking thing, but it was a really amazing vehicle to meet a lot of people, to be engaged in the design community, not just through selling books, but really like participating together. And also a way of like sort of aesthetic, uh, aesthetic play. And a lot of, a lot of you'll see is like this idea of vernacular and, um, and also just sort of, it was sort of a test kitchen for my own thoughts about like uh, working against modernism, uh, working like how, how audacious can I, can I get in terms of <laughs> uh, legibility with the design and working with Clara, who's a, a writer, like there was a lot of, um, uh, of humor and, and, and spirit within the, the text. Um, and so um, it was a very, yeah, really, really cool project. And just kind of show you that, like, it was great about having the publishing house, not just the books, but these sort of posters you get to make about events, which become these sort of like flat books or flat, flat ways of, it, of expressing um, thoughts on design. Um, and, and often you can, there's a word that it's new to me. I mean, it does my background. I'm Filipino American and from a generation that really didn't learn Tagalog or Filipino. And so, because this idea that you should assimilate, that you should become American, you should do good in school, all of that. And so um, uh, I learned these Tagalog words like much later in life. Uh, but there's one that like people often use here called Berloloi. Um, and it's sort of, there's no real direct translation into English, but it can sort of translate to um, sort of being overly ornamental, sort of a maximalist aesthetic, but not like Baroque, like high class. It's actually kind of seen as very like low class, masa. Um, and often I think that like people uh, use it to sort of describe the look of jeepneys, which is perfect because I love jeepneys. <laughs> And, um, and they kind of hold within themselves a kind of interesting history. Like they start off as like remnants of the World War II, sort of repurposed as like a sort of makeshift mass transit system. Um, and we can get, can get into some of that later, but I feel like they become this tabloid, uh, tableau, of like the histories of the drivers, the history of the Philippines, like the different waves of, um, waves of uh, influences like East, West, um, oftentimes can be described as like, a, a, like what it is to be Filipino in many ways. And so I just kind of want to not talk too much and just let you observe <laughs> just the beauty of some of these machines and the typography and design within them. And especially like when you're from the diaspora, Phil Am, and you visit the Philippines for the first time and you get off the airport and you're in a van or a truck this is the first, this is the thing that greets you into the Philippines, like more, more so than the airport, like you're greeted with the traffic. Um, and oftentimes these are on the road and they're so distinct to, to this place that you, you um, and I feel like this is, um, I think this, seeing these actually got me inspired to um, interface more with like, and, and question like, uh, you know, what caused these kind of design? Like who, who makes, um, who makes these? Um, what's the meaning behind the semiotics of, of these objects? Um, and like sometimes there's little clues, like okay, like why would they put a oil tanker on the on the on the left side of the boat? And you assume that maybe they have a brother or a cousin or their dad help pay for this jeep. Um, Again, this is just me and why, but most likely it's like, usually they pay homage to whoever helped sponsor or pay for the, the truck. And you'll see like, fam you'll see a lot of names of family members. And then sometimes it's like what they do for a living um, or where they come from, what country. Sometimes you'll see like Japan or, or I've seen a Switzerland one or a German one. Um, and this interesting Eurostar, which is like the name of the European train. Um, but yeah, I think this kind of led my own, like, sort of like, oh, you know, like, what is this design, this vernacular design, as they say, like, what is this typography? Um, and 
it, it, it's a shame that I came upon this kind of toward my last term while in grad school, but I realized like, yeah, like this is the thing I want to study. This is the thing I want to uh, research is um, this type of design, um, not having any value or like label on it, but just there's just something so interesting here. And it goes beyond just the aesthetics, but also the humor and the wordplay to it. Like can, like, how can we sort of describe this type of design? And in fact, um, as I always say, like hard, hard working, good looking came from the back of the taxi cab. Um, and so we it's sort of the first project that we uh, really head on delved into this was the Filipino folk foundry, which to this day is like um, sort of our, our hit single, <laughs> our, our book that will never sell out, even though we, we decided not to print anymore for, for various reasons. Um, but yeah, we really delved into sort of the aesthetics, the essays, uh, following up with other researchers who were not the only ones. I think every, many were part of a larger wave of, of other Filipino uh, researchers, amateur enthusiasts of, of Filipino typography. Um, but, uh, but through working with them, we were able to sort of track down and interview different sign painters, um, get them to do stroke manuals or type specimens. Um, I had them do the classic Western uh, way to start a font, Hamburga as a sort of, for me, a comment, but also, yeah, technically you could build a full font based on these strokes. And which is great as a follow-up uh, recently and a little plug for an exhibition that we're in in New York um, called Beyond Codex for, um, oh man, let's give another name, and Anthony Tino and, oh man, anyways, <laughs> it's an exhibition we're doing in, uh, in New York, but rather than, um, they said, oh, you know, when, when the curators reached out to us, like, oh, what should we do? And we had already gained, I don't know, we, I feel like I've gained so much in my life through working on the FFF book. We didn't want to really profit off it anymore and really sort of uh, shine a light to the sign painters like left. This is um, Edwin uh, Tayo. Um, and so we gave him the commission rather than us. We want to shine a light on his work um, and, and, you know, compensating him correctly in US dollars, not the uh, Filipino equivalent, um, peso equivalent to, to work on this. And, um, you know, not to kind of put numbers out there, but, you know, $400 for a commission isn't considered too much money in the States, but that could be a month or two months rent here. And I feel like there's a, and, and just to even just see that um, he, his work and his practice was put front and center, I think really like sort of impacted him. And what's great is that um, this made its way onto Facebook and his business sort of blew up after this. This was just like a, a month or so ago. And so um, again, I think more than even like the success of the FFF book, like uh, projects like these are kind of what I'm most proud about in terms of that project, like really making an impact. Um, and that includes in the, I think in the way that we printed the book, like we really want to highlight not just local aesthetics in terms of, you know, like you could easily just take a bunch of photos and then run away with them and print a book in Germany or something. But uh, we really wanted to highlight also printmaking here um, to kind of showcase that if you don't have access to offset litho, it's not a death sentence, you can still publish um, in this manner. Um, just sort of accessing what local local craftspeople that you have. And then also what's nice is just sort of highlighting the everyday life of, of artists here are, uh, in terms of the independent publishing scene, um, which is quite strong and um, um, almost militant, I would say. Um, uh, they like old school zine, the scene is like very old school zine where you don't pay, it's all just like broader system, very, very socialist. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's through this project has been great sort of interfacing with all the different printmakers here. And um, obviously now being based here, I'm really excited to continue these relationships and, and find more. Um, and yeah, the, the book was printed uh, Musograph, uh, which is, you know, something very special, special in the States, but here in the Philippines, and I think in Asia, just maybe because of our proximity 
to Japan. Um, the recent recent graph machines are, are, are easily accessible and quite ubiquitous. Um, and through this project, I want to just throw some projects that sort of like linked up with it. Um, but through uh, Alessandra Batista, who works at Spotify, she contacted me because of you know sort of this this book to do an identity for a series they have called Kalie, which means street, sort of like a the Filipino spelling of the Spanish word. Um, so the identity would have their house font, um, which I believe is like Octorot or something, and um, in, in combination with the local typography. So for this project, I sort of sifted through um, a bunch of like a bunch of different photos of like typographers on the street and sort of applied it into this um, identity system. And I checked it the other day. It's like, oh, it's, <laughs> it's kind of fun. Like, oh, all that work, and in, <laughs> in the end, it turns into just a little JPEG on the side. But you know, shout out to Spotify Philippines for this and. Um, I, I think it, it works quite well for uh, some use. And often through this, I, I work with a lot of uh, Filipino American designers who sort of also want to like um, uh, express their you know company or project identities through this kind of typography. So this is Keith Lafuente, who's a designer based in New York, um, fashion designer, and so um, this is a fun project sort of finding more like just weird and different uh, influences in Filipino typography and, and, and building out um, uh, a logo out of it or um, this is La Cita in LA. And, and since starting the FF project, FFF project, there's been so this sort of a resurgent, resurgence of um, Filipino typo typography that references sign painting and digitizing it. So for this project specifically, I wanted to highlight um, different Filipino, Filipino diaspora um, typographers, um, primarily sourcing them from a website called um, Plus 61, which is the area code here is 61. Um, so I just want to really highlight all the various, um, yeah, local making. And it's great that like sort of, there's been sort of a, a resurgence of the style. Um, part, and, and that's been part of a wave of, of, of this resurgence. Some other projects, this is with um, Ana Luisa Haseko, um, Henseko, sorry. <laughs> uh, this is like another project for, uh, so I, I'll maybe just click through these and not talk too much, but again, expressing more of, uh, and different versions of, of uh, an influence of uh, sign painting within uh, Filipino, Filipino diaspora graphic identity. Uh, and then this project will kind of lead to sort of the, the main lecture, the whole the, the part about realism that I was supposed to talk about. But um, uh, this is Data Cultura by Miko Reverenza. Um, he's a filmmaker and um, undocumented, or at the time undocumented, um, and and a good friend of mine. And um, we, we wanted to talk about um, we wanted to make something that would pair with a film he was making that sort of was a mix between cyberpunk and, um, you know, he had uh, the experiences of living as un undocumented um, and, um, and, and, and identity in terms of identity in terms of even your own personal one as someone, you know, specifically in the that aspera and with this feeling of um, what's the word? displacement. And this book was the first time he outwardly came out as undocumented, because you can imagine you have to kind of keep a low profile. And so we sort of uh, referenced cyberpunk typography on um, Emigre magazine. It was like really fun to kind of uh, to dive into this, because um, this fell into a, a type of design I, uh, I, I started off doing um, um, in, uh, when, I, when I started started schooling in, uh, this was the predominant style in the early 2000s, I'll just say. Um, so it was really, really fun to sort of dive into it again. Uh, but with, with my own way and with, with new references. 
Um, and here, like, it's like a mix between um, like screenplays, like letters he, uh, he was doing to his, his grandfather, but while he was taking acid, um, rejection letters from, from scholarships. But a, a key element too is that he was um, sort of, he was documenting different uh, modernist structures, postmodernist structures in LA um, as these, he would see them as these spaceships or uh, these fu these future structures to to create. Um, if you've seen AlphaGo, you can um, you can sort of repurpose these these structures to kind of create a, a, a cyber sci-fi narrative. Um, but this is an immigrant cyberpunk um, project, um, and he would use his, his grandfather and a uh, and uh, an Oculus, and this is his cousin. To do to do tours of the through, of Manila uh, through Google Earth. Um, at the time, he, he couldn't fly. You can imagine if you're undocumented, he couldn't fly. So this is his only way of reaching back into his <clears throat> his heritage and being born there. Um, some of the places that he grew up. Um, and here you're already seeing <clears throat> this 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 this, um, this architectural aesthetic rise that's like very. Um, predominantly concrete um, and, and sparse. And, um, and, and you can see like um, through, through this, like a, a, a need of connection um, with, with something that looks so foreign. Um, and so, brutalism. Um, yeah, so through that, that's a kind of an intro of just my work and my process. And now we'll sort of dive into uh, a history of the Philippines through, through architecture. Um, and so, I mean, there is definitely a prehistory of the Philippines and, 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 and the architecture of, of, um, of indigenous people, but for the sake of this, um, and, and sorry, that, that's a wrong caption on the left. Um, <clears throat> For the sake of this lecture, I, I want to talk about the colonial period, as in terms, at least in terms of a starting point. And this is like a, a super early photograph from, I think, the 1890s uh, from Manila. And here you see the predominance of uh, a, colonial, a colonial style. So these are the streets of Manila. Um, and so here you can see that, like, in, in the Philippines, we have this unique um, or not unique. I mean, there's many like trade cities that have this east-west um, bipolarity going on in terms of influences, and in particular, like I think this really summed up the style of in which um, Manila was colonized. It was really centralized in the capital, Manila, and not not much other building was done other than for churches and. Um, you know, municipal, municipal, municipal structures or forts. Um, but in terms of uh, sort of a more um, bourgeois uh, uh, merchant class <laughs> sort of everyday architecture, it was much more prominent in, in Manila and a, and a few other cities. But, um, but here um, you can kind of see that um, to just the different, the, yeah, just, uh, just how life was was at the time. Um, so I, like, this is sort of just to achieve a baseline of just like how it looked before um, through these images. And and you kind of see this architectural style, right? And that that's described as uh, Baha'i Nabato, which literally means, and, and <laughs> part of, for my bad to call again, if anyone's Filipino in, in this in the chat, like. Um, pardon, but it really it, it literally means stone house, and so it was an importation of like many of 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 a sort of Spanish way of building structures, and some argue maybe uh, influenced by Chinese architecture as well, um, with with some touches of uh, of of an indigenous structure we'll see that are called the Baha'i Kubo. Um, but you can see it's like the stone was primarily adobe or some sort of lava rock, different different, uh, it, they would just pick from whatever local quarries. Um, but this is also a reason why uh, 
there's, uh, there wasn't so many of these um, at the time, these, uh, this sort of housing, it's, it's quite heavy and labor intensive to create them. So it really was a certain class that could afford them. Um, um, and, but, and oftentimes like, um, you know, if you describe what a colony is, it's, it's a monopoly on, on, on enterprise and trade. And really the Spanish created a, a society that was like really racist in the sense that like, it really was about colorism, about your, your proximity to whiteness. The, the closer you were to Spanish blood, the more freedoms that you were given, like special, like, you know, on top of it was actually, the actual term for a Filipino was a white Spanish um, settler who was born in the Philippines. Those were the Filipinos. Then after that was the uh, mestizos, who were any sort of mix of either, um, indigenous with, with Spanish blood or uh, with Chinese blood. There was Chinese mestizos who were like one room down. They made a whole sort of like color chart. Um, the last on the bottom being the, uh, the Indios, they call us Indians, um, basically brown folk. And perhaps at the, even more at the bottom were the, uh, the Aita who were like the, 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 at, the Aboriginal people of the Philippines. Um, the, real, the real first people here. Um, so anyways, um, there was a revolution uh, by these, uh, this group called the Katipuna. Actually, my, grand, my great grandfather was one of them in Pampanga, like no one special, he was like the treasurer. <laughs> but um, um, yeah, essentially like, they have a long history that I could get into, but I won't. Um, and they definitely was a lot of infighting, like many revolutions, and they weren't perfect. Um, but they were one of the first groups to sort of assert uh, a nationalism, um, even though it was faulty um, in, in, in fairness to uh, my brothers and sisters from Visayas and Mindanao. They, they definitely weren't necessarily like uh, unified with the uh, Filipinos from, the, from the, cent the center and from the south. This is much more of a revolution centered in Luzon, um, even though there was fighting by the areas. Um, and so they were very close to um, trying to get their independence from the, uh, the Spanish, but right around the time that they, they were trying to maybe, it's all very murky, the actual history, right around the time to kind of negotiate like a treaty with them, the Americans came in a kind of hostile takeover, um, entered as liberators, but really, um, decided to stay and to colonize the Philippines on their own. Um, and so here you can see on the left, this is much more of the uh, common indigenous structure, the, the, uh, the Baha'i Kubo on the, on the right. Um, and they introduced a, an American style, which is sort of a mix of neoclassical with, uh, you know, the industrial industrialization. Of that. Yeah, I think that's just the, the the definition of neoclassical. Um, and, you know, these things are supposed to meant to, you know, embody progress, um, enterprise, um, order, <clears throat> the public works. And of course that, that uh, you know, created trade, they, you know, and even they, the earliest designs of the American dollar bill that you see in your pocket right now, if you're based in the States, um, it was based upon the Philippines peso, actually. Um, so yeah, there, this is, you know, this is this sort of golden era that many uh, more, what we'll call them, yeah, lack of, I don't want to peg them as fascist, but yes, this is the era that they look at, you know, this is sort of like the 40s. I think that that's even true here in the United States. Um, and of course, with that came corporatism and the sort of rebranding of the, the military as like, uh, like, I think that's like true with many, many countries that have like uh, an American style colonialism, like uh, Vietnam or uh, North, I'm oh, sorry, South Korea, is that like, there's all of this, uh, there's this specter of the American military here that's like embedded into the culture. And, We'll see that this is later as well. Um, um, and also there, uh, there was a time of Japanese occupation as well. 
And then World War II started, and that just kind of put a halt to all this sort of forward momentum, all this construction and building, and and this like again that that period was <laughs> the Pearl, uh, Manila as the Pearl of the Orient, um, and um, the fighting during World War II like leveled all of that, like just completely destroyed all of it. Um, and I think that like, it, it's not talked about enough, I, I feel, because in the end, actually, it wasn't the Japanese that bombed um, Manila, it was actually the Americans um, in, their, in <laughs> their rationale is to liberate. Um, and so um, they, they say within the bombings of Manila, like something like 100,000 as a, con like a conservative estimate died. It's, it's like up there with Poland is like the two largest sort of casualties in terms of a bombing campaign. Um, these are more deaths than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, and you can imagine like the destruction of all these buildings that, that carry history uh, can cause a, a sort of amnesia uh, or a, a, yeah, a complete uh, erasure of memory. Um, so yeah, the, one of these things. But, but in the wake of that <laughs> quick transition was a reconstruction period where they would either use um, now the modernist style, like much more bluntly um, modernist um, and often using, uh, or, or yeah, this is another, uh, modernist building. Actually, like a quick, as a quick sort of linking my own biography into this, um, this is a hospital that my my grand Lola, my basically my 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 grandfather's sister started in Pampanga, which is like a province in the central Luzon. And my memories of for me, this hospital is my memories of the Philippines growing up because when I would visit, this is where we'd stay on the roof. You can see a, a, a house and this is the area, this is where I would hang out when I was a kid, um, visiting the Philippines. I wasn't really a Manila person, like we just go here to Pampanga and pretty much just stay in this house for the summers. Um, so yeah, that's interesting. But it's interesting seeing like, oh wow, it's actually made in this mid-century style. Um, very, very interesting looking. Um, so it's either in that mid-century that mid style or they would do this copy texture where they would um, recreate that the old American or even Spanish colonial look, but through poured, con poured con uh, cement. Um, and then you can kind of see the, <laughs> the Bololoi that I mentioned before sort of already entering. And as you can see here, it's like uh, the jeepneys, uh, you can see them here is like sort of in before you can see the Kalesas as the public transportation, the, the horse-drawn carts. And now you're slowly seeing the, the, the rise of the, um, the GP. Um, and yeah, this sort of embodied the American era. Um, and, and, and still during this time, we weren't fully independent from the states or going through sort of a, a transitionatory period. And then, and then comes the actual Brutalism part of the lecture. Um, and so toward the late 60s, uh, this style started to become uh, predominate. It was an international movement, um, brutalism. But you can see in contrast to uh, the lightness or the, uh, the abstraction of some of the uh, mid century modern uh, buildings, this is very blunt. Um, it's very uh, monumental, um, it's monolithic, it's heavy, um, but at the same time, uh, it, it's more sculptural in a way. And, uh, and we'll go into the, the reasons why, but the, the essential tenet of, of Brutalism is concrete. Uh, this is uh, the two, uh, two key examples to the left is by Le Corbusier. This is a, a public housing structure in, in France. And to the right is uh, the Pirelli Tire Building by, um, by Paul Rudolph, who also designed the architecture building in, in, at Yale. 
but uh, brutalism comes from the French word uh, beton brut, which means raw concrete. But it also, uh, it started in Europe and, you know, has made, like it had its own sort of uh, mode in different cultures in a way. Yeah, it's very much an international style um, in, in, in uh, Eastern, oh, sorry, in Eastern Europe and Northern Europe, it became called functionalism. It was like a socialist, uh, a socialist, uh, had a socialist quality to it. Um, but, but uh, and these are the works of, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to get the name right. Um, Kenzo Tanage or Tange, um, and this is how brutalism looked like in Japan. So I think like it's sort of because of the way how cheap concrete is, how pragmatic it is, how it can easily be shaped into different forms and objects. It's actually quite, um, despite its look, quite freeing, um, and even uh, it had a different quality. In terms of the tropics uh, of they, sometimes they call it equatorial brutalism. These are um, these are buildings in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and uh, in particular, in in the way that it um, inter interfaces with with the tropical foliage, the the vegetation, it, it actually creates like a different quality from when it was in Europe, and it looks it look so cold and opposing. It disappears more um, um, into the landscape in, in, in many tropical contexts. Um, and to the left is a uh, city plan by Le Corbusier. But essentially these, yeah, these are just cement blocks, these hollow blocks. Um, these buildings can be mass produced. And so like hidden within sort of like some of the architecture moves, the, the bottom line is like it's very, very pragmatic and um, um, re uh, repeatable. Um, and so you can, here's uh, examples now going back to Manila uh, of, of different buildings um, that are Buddhist. And I, I don't know, I find these fascinating. And when you're, as I'm really living here and at full, um, as a full-time, uh, I'm not a Filipino citizen, I'm a resident, <laughs> an alien resident. Um, really admire these buildings are still here. Um, like they are so massive and they, <laughs> they're so dense. Like good luck, just like good luck dropping a bomb on this, I guess, or like <laughs> or, or breaking these down. And, and I think that was on purpose. I think um, uh, uh, Alan and Peter Smithson, the architectural uh, critics. Uh, called them a, um, this is me very, they're kind of a rough poetry being dragged out of uh, the confused and powerful forces at work. So like this sort of, you can kind of see a, a, a conflict or a, almost like a uh, over, <laughs> over exertion of power and authority, or maybe this idea of like, uh, uh, and you can see this is during, this is also during um, the period of, uh, Fernando Marcos that this need to pose a will or 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 have some uh, element of uh, staying power rather than how ephemeral um, some other buildings can look. This one, uh, the San Miguel Corporation building, was uh, and they start to as you can see they can take on a um, local vernacular or local aesthetic in different ways. This in this case. They made it look like the rice terraces in, in the north of Luzon. Um, and, and many argue that these had a decolonial um, aesthetic as well, that they weren't looking at, and you can see they, they were trying to make something that didn't reference um, necessarily the West or particularly um, America, but things that uh, reference a, a pre-colonial time. Um, this, this church, for example, like is supposed to feel like a sail or, uh, or, or something, <laughs> something related to um, a time before Spanish influence. Um, there's more buildings and they have quite interesting within it, uh, as, you look, uh, as you zoom in, like the, the, the concrete can be molded into these textures 
I create a lot of uh, interesting um, facades and and um, in the way that really meant to, it can feel dystopian <laughs> to some, but I find them uh, hugely fascinating. Um, and uh, a lot of, and uh, we'll speak on why maybe later, but uh, these are sort of ruins living within a particular area of uh, a mineral called uh, uh, in, in, in Makati, a particular area called Lagaspi village. Um, it's currently being revived now, but for a long time, this is like, you know, there's a few public works and a few things here, but a lot of the buildings were abandoned or in, the, in some sort of uh, a limbo state. And, 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 but they somehow preserve over time because of the density of the, and us sort of achieving the, the mission. Uh, Rainer Bannum um, uh, 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 what's the word? Uh, defined uh, brutalism in his own way as uh, having three key features, um, memorability as image, uh, clear exhibition of structure, uh, evaluation of materials as found. So as you can see, you can see that like you, you see the structures at place very, very, they're not, nothing's hidden. The materiality, the, like the concrete is just in your face. Um, and with, with most of these, um, they might not have like uh, the most uh, intriguing uh, image, but they're, they're, they're buildings that are kind of meant to, uh, almost like a logo, like they're there, you see it, it can be abstract, but you remember it. Um, but I, you begin to kind of see um, this sort of uh, repeating theme of, of a floating mass on top of a um, uh, on top of a base, um, it's, and it's repeated quite a lot in, in many of the Brutalist buildings. Um, Lelisandro Loxon being the, one of the key architects during this time, um, who who met uh, Paul Rudolph and Kenzo uh, Tanage um, in the 60s. Um, and these have a clear, you have a, specifically he writes about having this floating effect. And it comes from the humble Baha'i Kubo as you saw uh, much earlier. Um, and these were designed in a way for, for airflow. Obviously that there's a, a concept of being resistant to flood, which is the thing here. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I think the Baha'i Kubo is, there's even songs about the Baha'i Kubo. Like it's, it's much ingrained in, in terms of the uh, Filipino identity. Um, and the, the biggest Baha'i Kubo of them all is the cultural center of the Philippines, which was the hallmark project of Imelda Marcos. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, you could see the purpose of this building straight away. Um, uh, as a, and it's interesting that it's the cultural center. This is not the, um, uh, you know, it's not the seat of the government, it's not the White House. It's, it's, it's about uh, the sort of predominance or this sort of um, ownership over the monopoly of the culture. Um, and again, it was started by Fernando Marcos. This is a famous image of the day that he declared martial law. Um, and you'll see how they used the CCP as part of this um, strategy um, together um, in terms of uh, using in, the, in that definition, in the definition of the edifice, uh, 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 sorry, um, the edifice, edifice, complex <laughs> as using these buildings as propaganda. Um, and it was, uh, as one author put it, it's a, it was a conjug conjugal dictatorship. It wasn't just Marcos, like Imelda was clearly part of it. Um, some some of apologists call her the co-president of the Philippines and really believe that <laughs> she was like, you know, essentially they, they, they banished themselves as, as kings, but, um, and also celebrities, they, they kind of met every terrible person in the world. Um, here's um, uh, 
uh, yeah, here's Imelda with, with Reagan, here's with Gaddafi, Saddam, Prince Charles, Johnson, there's their buddies with Mr. Trumpet. Um, and, but the thing about um, when Marcos, in terms of the, the policies that he had in terms of when he came into power, it's interesting actually. Um, and I think why I, I don't wanna treat as much as like a boogeyman or like honestly, personally, I would see anything related to him and I just would have all this hate um, on a personal level, um, you know, martial law was the reason why my my mom decided not to to move back to the Philippines, and and, and she was a a, a protester um, during uh, you know, during during the pre martial law because I think even before then, like um, she was doing all these um, different different atrocities during that time. Um, but he came in as someone decolonial actually he had a lot of these ideas of creating a new filipino uh of, of like fighting against um imperial forces and this and this and that I, it was all marketing for sure um but you can see even within the design of these pamphlets like that use of that um the script the script face as a, as a way of sort of like marking a a, a new aesthetic um, using design as a way to push forward their agenda. But they also put forward this idea of being his first family, almost like a JFK. Um, here are the three Marcos kids. There's BBM um, as a little, little kid there. Like, look at these, oh, that's terrible. Uh, but, um, <laughs> but the CCP was designed to be this culture city. It wasn't just <clears throat> the, main, the main hall there, but also there was a, um, a, a, a film complex in the works, there was a convention center, there's a folk arts, uh, folk arts center as well. Um, and so the idea is that they were sort of uh, weaponizing culture um, in, in many ways of, of you know, uh, this is, this is uh, and it faces West, which I think is very, very sort of like purposeful. This is like a Rojas Boulevard um, when it was first made, and um, they created an extension around it. Originally, it was a naval base, but they created an extension, and, and that's in which they put this huge flying ship, this Baha'i Kuba over, over Manila. And even, you know, still, like even before they were, before this election, you could feel their their specter constantly when you're in on the, the west side of Manila. Um, growing up, I didn't know that. And I, and I thought that like, oh, look at this interesting building. But as you learn the history, it became like something very scary and imposing to enter. And I, to be honest with you, I was uh, too, almost too afraid to do so. Um, but um, actually I was able to, uh, because a friend of mine had an event there related to the, the 13 artists award, um, I was able to enter the building. And this is like, um, Lilisandro uh, Loxon, uh, sorry, um, described his, his style as like a ha having a bipolarity. So with how imposing the outside of the structure was the inside was more human scale, generous. Um, it's very elegant. This almost feels like a, a, a gown flowing down um, the stairs. Um, there's like this very interesting seating and um, the chandelier is made from capice, which is like, in a way, this is like a mix between the, an indigenous material and then obviously this Western form. Um, it creates a like, confusion in me because I want to hate this so much. And yet when you're there, like it is such a captivating experience. I, I left very confused when I, when I visited. Um, um, and, and, and I think this sort of marks sort of where I'm coming to in terms of like having to interface with this history. Um, like, yeah, you know, these buildings, like they did represent uh, a few abuses of power and uh, a cronyism, a uh, oligarchy, but some at the same time, I can't deny 
that these forms are intriguing and as a designer like i i like them uh, well, yeah like it was, uh, hopefully you guys feel as baffled as i do and even there was like hint, hint, uh, hits of color that they did within the plaza of the ccp um uh, the, like i've never been back here this is this is so interesting to see um and for and 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 their programming like kind of like their, their first the first play that they did the first opera that they did there wasn't you know importing a, a western opera or a spanish opera into it they really were going pre-colonial indigenous um and they had a play like that was set in in in, uh, in the south um it looks like mindanao and uh, it was all centered around a pre-colonial village and that was the first um uh the first event at the CCP. Um, and they also hosted um, events that uh, highlighted local material. This is a, uh, we got Sur and like, this is a, a, a show about Filipino printmaking. And as a printmaker, I'm like, oh, wow, this is so, this is really cool. <laughs> like, I'm confused, like, wait. But at the same time, they did these like very audacious things. And this is almost like boldly uh, stating their sort of uh, power over, this is already 74 when they had like deep control, deep martial law was like 72. And so this is sort of, so, sort of way that's kind of assert their dominance um, using the CCP. Um, and this is, sorry, the images are really, really blurry, but this was an event called uh, Kasaisai on Alahi, which essentially means the history of the, the race, the history of the Filipino race. Um, and there was this, this parade, this pageantry, like where they um, employed something like, I wish I had my numbers with me, but something like almost like 30 or 40,000 um, different uh, citizens to be part of this parade and another 100,000 were in attendance. Um, and it, it feels, just really on its face, like fascist. This could be a march in North Korea right now where they use um, people in costume as a way of like um, in an evolutionary fashion from pre-colonial to colonial to tell the history of the Philippines. And so in the beginning you saw um, indigenous tribes people, um, you see here you already see on the Top right, you're seeing conquistadors. Um, you're seeing uh, the Chinese immigrants that are like a, a presence here. Um, Muslim Filipinos as well. Um, there's that. This is the whole <laughs> earlier American War period that I was mentioning. They had them there, and they even like started employing like farmers at the very end. They started to go into the, the current age, which is the show like farmers on purpose because they they. they called themselves like farming reformers and also um, all these women in, in these um, Filipiania dresses as so would also kind of employ like hey, fashion design progress and it's all meant to sort of describe or like sort of position the Philippines as this like new society that Marcos was, was creating um, and um, it, it was almost sort of prayed in a way that felt almost like a tourism guide uh, I think that was like one of their uh, main, um, main main concepts. And so here you can see how they're weaponizing culture in a, in a very blunt way. And they 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 their weapon was um, tourism. Um, this idea that um, the CCP was this place to foster uh, <coughs> culture, but it couldn't just be for this. You know, culture should just be free for the sake of people, but really it was uh, for to be monetized, um, to bring in foreign investment, to like more selfishly like position the Philippines as this um, <clears throat> world world influencer in some way. Um, this all this going down and all this money spent, despite the fact that the average Filipino, I think at that time, got paid two hundred and sixty dollars a year, um, and the joke of showing all these indigenous things that they they dis, uh, de, uh, dispossessed so many indigenous peoples, um, tribes of their land under the concept that, you know, within the Philippines, right, there is like, the, 
we don't really have an identity in the same sense of, of many other countries. Um, like we are very, um, uh, everyone rep uh, sort of identifies to their province. Like I'm not just Filipino, I'm Kapapangan. Um, my wife is not just Filipino, but her, her roots are Tagalog. Um, uh, certain friends have family in, I have friends in Cebu, the Cebuano, like that's how your identity is. But their idea is to create this kind of nationalism. And I feel like that is a hallmark of fascism, of creating a sort of unified, uh, a, um, unified race. Like I think they they really push race as a hallmark of nation, rather a uh, rather than a confederation of different peoples and an alliance, like all these more democratic values. Um, and so it was also a scheme of depossessing de uh, native lands um, in many ways. And, um, uh, and, 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 and using travel as, <laughs> as this like um, uh, oppressive regime. Um, these are these, are these catalogs. But at the same time, you know, like they were asserting a decolonial aesthetic, like these things that I'm very deeply into. Um, you could read some of the essays by Marcos or Amelda Marcos, or Fernand Marcos or Amelda Marcos, and you would think, oh, this is like Franz Fanon, who's like, the, the, the famous African decolonial um, theorist. Um, and so part of the programming was and um, sort of employing different artists that were, you know, in their own way, like honestly uh, researching uh, indigenous things and but also um, sort of using it as propaganda. So this is one of my favorite um, sound artists, sound theorist, Jose Maceda, who did a lot of field field recordings in uh, different provinces of Manila, the idea of like sort of documenting all the different sounds. Um, but he also did these John Cage-esque performances that uh, Amelda Marcos funded. Um, and I don't fault him for, for doing so. I mean, they, they were in the seat of power in the beginning. I, no one knew that he was gonna declare martial law. It was just working with the government. Uh, but you can see how they were they were using him for their aims of, of creating this new identity, um, and um, he, he a very interesting musician who also uh, included space within um, within his sound designs. Like this is a, a a piece that he built specifically for this brutalist uh, chapel uh, in the area of Quezon City, um, and they even. He did this really interesting performance with the radio, like using all the found uh, sounds. He sort of did this uh, wall, this sort of music concrete, using all these found sounds broadcasted on like something like a hundred radio waves, uh, or using a hundred cassette tapes. And they would do it in the CCP and like kind of create these concophonies. But again, it was all just for a photo op <coughs> for a Mel to be like almost like this this mother like sort of uh, benevolently like sponsoring all these events um, and, and this culture in the culture. Um, and the CCP also like was really in support of uh, hard edge modern, uh, modernist paintings, which were, you know, also I feel like this really echoes um, the style at the time, but also the architecture itself. Um, and there's also a lot of interesting graphic design from this period related to the communications of the cultural, um, the CCP. And they had this, the smaller gallery called the smaller galleries would be more independent. Um, and this is one of the, um, uh, one of the, the influential designers from that period. Um, and let's see. his name right now, wow. Albino, Albino, something, Al <laughs> my God, this is a really rough lecture, by the way. I, <laughs> I'm just gonna give that as a preface to anyone who isn't here below. This is like research I've done for a long time, but I'm sort of just sort of uh, pulling it all together. So I, I feel like that meme of that guy, like with all the stuff on the wall and doesn't have all the stuff together, but that's just where it's at right now. Um, but yeah, really interesting, like the colonial, modernist, hard-edged graphic design from this period that was very, very interesting. Um, one of my favorite ones is this, is this um, green circle 
which is for the Philippine Coconut Authority. I thought, what a genius, what a genius design. Or this AAVA, this is actually the village that I'm in. And they're referencing the Bahai Kubo or the, or the stone house. Um, so very, very interesting era of design. And I think kind of marks that kind of international modernist period as well. Um, so then there's like very interesting, again, it's very generous, the CCP. There's all this interesting seating and interesting areas that like actually architects now like don't really, um, uh, really sort of consider in their designs. Um, and there's like, there's like a, this is Arturo Luz and there's like definitely like the, the fine art in this period also sort of reflected this sort of era of building and the use of these, this concrete material or these industrial materials. Or there is, this is Roberto Ch uh, Chabet, who was kind of like deconstructuralist or postmodernist and sort of reacting against the materials. Um, and this is another piece, like sort of showing like the sort of, and if you don't know, this is like a, a, a Tahoe, uh, like a to it's like a tofu vendors like set up and they, they would do sort of these different events with um, using them as like almost like architectural structures. And then even there was like definitely an like independent artist scene in Manila at that time. Um, but one of their events is that they, they created like a gallery within the gallery of the CCP. So they, you know, the CCP was sort of employed by um, these, all these independent artists in some way. You kind of had to, there's no avoiding it. It was like this, this um, all like their presence and for so long um, touched so many people. I mean, just to even tell you my own history with it, like my, I just, I'm like, hey, mama, you told me that you you taught in school before you moved to the States. He's like, yeah, it's like, actually, like, Emmy Marcos was my, was one of my students. So, like, my mom taught our class to one of those Marcoses, the, one of the Marcos kids, like, the the, the, the older daughter. Um, so, it's like, okay, like, so everyone's history has some sort of, and as, as you live here, too, you, you realize, like, there, like, there's no area that they didn't have a monopoly over. Um, or exploit. Um, so just kind of showing more interesting sort of postmodern um, deconstructed um, sculptures and paintings during that time. It was very interesting and but largely like um, for as much as they were saying that the, um, the CCP was going to be for for the people like um, a lot of people felt alienated by like this work um, and so it, it really didn't provide the effect that they were going for in terms of uh, the masa. And, and in fact, a lot of artists were either doing these tongue in cheek things or like full on um, protesting within the CCP. This is um, uh, Medelia, Med Robert Medelia, uh, Roberto. It was like a, the artist Medelia like did this famous um, protest within the CCP and, and very blunt and already knew, this is already in 69, that like, this was like a fascist tomb, the kind of, uh, it's a mystification of all the atrocities going on. And, um, and sort of it's still, despite its like idea of being anti-imperial was still funded by America in many, in, in very direct ways. Um, this, so, Malakas at Maganda, um, which means strong and beautiful and it kind of, plays into the creation myth, uh, indigenous creation myth of the Philippines. Um, so this is idea that this, this God, this bird came and he split open this bamboo and two, two people emerged like Malak Malakas, the strong and Maganda, the beautiful. And this, these are the people that sort of, um, uh, this is the Adam of Eve of the Philippines. Um, this is the creation of, of the indigenous Filipinos. Um, and literally they thought of themselves, this is how full of themselves they were. They weren't just, you know, like maybe it's how power corrupts. Like you're not just now like the, the father and the mother of the nation. You're literally these, these God figures now like merging from the bamboo and like creating this new society or whatever crazy thing they're thinking about. And I think this is the, one of the reasons why <laughs> I think it's so good to demystify and engage with this history more is to kind of see how absurd and silly it was when, and before, like I would really react to it with such hate, but now I, I, I feel it more, um, 
even more empowered to interface with them, just kind of seeing how ridiculous and silly they were as well. And Imelda really saw herself as, uh, uh, as a, a, little, of a princess, like she had this like sort of, who knows how real it is, but this bio uh, biography of almost being this like Cinderella from a known family being like, um, being picked by this like um, ambitious politician and they're gonna sort of like take over the nation and, and, and you know, give, give the, you know, like act, act in this way as these reformers. Um, and I think it's interesting, again, the GP in the back. Um, but she was really obsessed with beauty. Uh, and I think, at, 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 and not just on a personal, but as a political tool. Um, and, and it kind of marks with the Filipinos, like obsession with beauty um, came around this time when um, Gloria Diaz um, won Miss Universe. And to show you how important it is, she won, but the moon landing <laughs> didn't make the top of the fold, you know? And if you actually look at the other side of the fold, there's no image of uh, Lance Armstrong. It's, this is the main image. It's just Gloria Diaz. I mean, you know, um, <laughs> um, a moment of pride and all these kind of things. And, and um, but I feel like it sort of, this sort of created the seeds of employing uh, the Miss Universe pageant as this, this tool of a cultural tool where I wouldn't say in, in any cultures that has the same significance as here, where I think here people watch Miss America to this day, like it's the Super Bowl, like people hug around, they like get together, they watch it. They, there's like, there's all these minor pageants, like a kind of minor league and like, it's, it's bigger here than basketball. I, I, <laughs> or on an equal presence as basketball, I would say. And it didn't, and it really did help that in uh, four years later in 1973, um, we, we, won, we won Miss Universe again. And since then we've won two other times in a total of four. Um, and again, yeah, like, to, like she saw it as like a clear tool of presenting us into like this global stage and sort of positioning ourselves with very, very like obvious here within Western, Western, the Western gaze. Um, and in fact, like one of the one of the, the structures there, the Folk Arts Museum was called the Folk Art Museum, but really it was created to be the stage for Miss Universe in 1974, um, which they which they obviously timed. They did the Miss Universe pageant just before that 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 uh, history of the the history of the race parade that you saw and sort of this unfeeling of the CCP, um, and they're and again like launching the Philippines as this sort of. Uh, global presence. And, and briefly I wanna, but it all didn't work. I mean, obviously there was that, but there's definitely a lot of these tragedies in, in their rush and their hubris to create all these structures, like definitely like problems arise. Um, and I just wanna like state if anyone's like kind of squeamish, like, um, like there's gonna be a few images here that are kind of disturbing, but this is the, the tragedy of the Philippine uh, Film Center. So in their rush to create the film center for like, again, same, almost the same year, 1974, they were kind of like on the time, all these kind of things, um, like there was a huge collapse in the building and something like a um, hundred, 113 people died within the wreckage and the, the criminality behind it, like they, did, they didn't want the bad PR, they didn't want uh, people to know. So rather than let the emergency people rush into the building, they had them wait for six hours or something. And I believe they were burying the bodies so that um, they wouldn't find them. And so they, they found a, a few, so they can claim that only like a handful died when really like many, many people uh, um, were undiscovered. And I feel like th this kind of uh, is the, the point of the matter and um, that <clears throat> all of the beauty mass, like all of the, the failures of policy all of the, um, the, 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 the brutality that, that was underneath the service, of, uh, the service of martial law, like they kidnapped a lot of, they're, they're, they particularly um, targeted students, uh, student activist leaders and uh, journalists during this time. Um, I wish I had the numbers, but it, it's within the thousands of, 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 of people abducted and, and murdered this way. And, and people really sort of, um, in terms of, yeah, again, I'm talking about the agrarian farm and like marching out uh, farmers and indigenous people, like 
people really were fighting them to maintain their land. And in fact, um, the reason my father moved to America is because they, they dispossessed my family of, the, of our land and it bankrupted us. And so we had no other choice other than to move to LA and like kind of start over in the state. So that kind of, this kind of, the martial law created so much uh, in the sake of progress, in the sake of decoloniality, like really sort of um, created generational trauma that's probably like gonna take a few more generations to exercise. Um, and I'm sorry for showing some of these, but these are just some of the like protesters being gunned down, all these massacres, like people literally had to like, this is a voting box. Like they, for, for some of the elections that they would still steal, they would <clears throat> protect the boxes from being um, <clears throat> tampered with in some way. Um, so like as much as like they want to show the Filipino as a, a, within their, this context of this, this uh, fantasy, this pre-colonial fantasy, like for me, this is the true Filipino, these people fighting for, for equity, for rights, for, for freedoms, for actual democracy that, you know, that we've been striving for since forever. Um, and then there became this like haves and haves nots, like definitely like there was this other experience of martial law that wasn't equal to everyone else's. Um, like a uh, uh, journalist described the other day as like, it's like if we're all boats on the water and a huge wave or a storm or typhoon hit, like it didn't hit all boats the same way. And so, so pe different people have different memories of it. And so this is the, another brutalist building, the uh, Manila Airport Terminal 1, um, which, and again, sorry for a bad image, but even this building became a site for a, a martial law atrocity. So one of the, uh, the main opposition leader who was in exile, Burkina, uh, Benito Aquino was like gunned down and people still don't know who shot him um, but as he landed in Terminal 1, and since then, it's been renamed um, in his name in, because of this incident. Um, and I think that was the, essentially the, the straw that broke the camel's back, amongst many other things, and that created this, this huge popular uprising called P the People Power Movement. Um, and so, um, yeah, it became this popular uprising. I mean, you have to do something wrong. Like these, these nuns are very iconic, but the even the church turned on them. The elements of the military turned on them. Um, uh, this is like another one of these building projects they all talk about, like, oh, the, uh, EDSA, this freeway system that they created, like this, the, you know, all this progress that they made, but, um, and this is like a key site here, this, this, um, this uh, memorial, at, at, and this was like a planned um, brutalist um, <clears throat> that was rejected, but was planned for the, the structure, but it came co-opted as a, a, a protest site that uh, this is all just word of mouth. People all arrived here to this Edsa Square to um, essentially boycott the, the stolen election. And um, that, I'm, I'm pretty happy to see this Monte Nupa city banner on the on the middle of this the this the area of Manila that I live. Um, but yeah they 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 yeah staged this walkout essentially um, over over days and at a certain point it became too much and the Marcos is, is fled and um, in many ways like um, it was a, this rec uh, reclamation reclamation of the identity of which the mark uh, of Marcos's have like sort of, uh, uh, yeah, had a monopoly over, had control over, were employing to 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 do all these like um, uh, terrible measures. Um, so as an epilogue, um, here's some projects that we've done, sort of like capture a certain feeling of uh, post post uh, martial law period. And this is with the artist uh, Othello Gravincho, who's like um, you know, a contemporary. Um, and we, we gave him a bunch of research, of which a mix of, of like Filipino punk from the 1980s, which started during um, martial law and described also the post martial law era, um, uh, kind of mixed with like uh, found objects and things. Um, and again, it's like, it, 
did you think you had conducted this this project like so long ago and kind of seen like still within this like sort of post Marcos era some of these uh, hard brutalist type logos survive? Um, so that was really interesting to show. And more directly, uh, and I think maybe linking to um, uh, MFG um, the 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 residency we did in Philadelphia with Ulysses um, came during a time of uh, sort of feeling already that like Marcos, Marcos is gonna maybe, he's planning something already. They, they, they've been planning a return for almost like 13, 15 years. And um, Duterte was this sort of harbinger, like this guy that sort of we felt um, could normalize uh, the br brutality under his administration kind of normalize uh, an easy way for a, a Marcos to, to come in. And so we, we, we uh, went to a different archivist who, who lent us their archive of, of these uh, Mosquito Press books, but basically these, um, these small journals that were made one of one, just passed within journalists because they were being abducted and murdered uh, to at least still document um, what was happening or remember um, their times being um, uh, jailed without, without trial for years on end. Um, and so at Ulysses, we staged a sort of, uh, in a way our own version of, I feel like, like some sort of underground that would discuss, um, that would have been discussing these um, uh, atrocities. But then during this time, we were talking more, more directly about the killings during uh, Duterte's war on drugs and talking with reporters who um, were too scared actually to fully report or their sources were too, too scared to fully come forward with their information. So it was a way within a smaller circulation of at least sharing these ideas and this memory. Um, and we immediately made it a communal space with food and like with yoga and like deep listening sessions. Like um, we invited a archivist from Philly who um, has a collection of leftist materials and uh, uh, revolutionary materials and that uh, sort of wound us way into the project. We had this Raspberry Pi uh, that had like, like digital um, archives of, of these same content. Um, and then it, it culminated in this uh, really, really small run 20 issue or the 20 edition of 20 publication called uh, Colombo Bulletin. Um, that we produced there just within uh, just whatever the, the local print shop at uh, UPenn and, um, and, and at, at the, and, which, and UPenn also has their own lucigraph there. So we were able to put that into it. And we were just taking all these um, materials at the, at the time and kind of bring it back to light. <clears throat> And so, yeah, and then later on, which is great is that through the residency and through Ulysses um, and with inventory press, we were able to sort of circulate it yet once again within this publication. Um, so as an afterward um, and more directly about a current, current events, like, yeah, like martial law didn't die. Um, and <laughs> well, <laughs> this is like a really, really interesting image. Like when Marcos himself died, they embalmed him like a mummy, like like a dictator, like like Lenin, um, within this like glass cage, waiting for him to be able to be buried within um, the Philippines again because he wasn't allowed back. Um, but in the middle of the night, they buried him there under under uh, under Duterte, and I think that sort of uh, created the window in which, or sort of embodied the window or this resurgence of. Uh, or nostalgia for their time in power. Um, yeah, I don't know. This is him. This is BBM. This little kid who like claims he's his own man, but like clearly, like, was created to be his father's heir, like Prince Charles in some way. And here's him like acting like, essentially like a <clears throat> an aristocrat. Um, at his quote unquote time in Oxford, which is like very contested whether he actually even graduated. Um, 
yeah, and here we are now, like where, <laughs> like all all of this like search into vernacular, um, <clears throat> typography, identity has wound itself here at a time where um, who knows what this, it's he's such a wild card about like no one, really no one will know what he'll really do in power. Um, but like, I feel reassured that yeah, if he, if he acts out, we'll, we're going to react. And um, until then, like, I think that we should sort of look, look at this time period more um, in its face and, and teach its history. I think that's an element of why it's been able to be so pervasive is that it's sort of just been this thing in the shadow. And now that it's into light, maybe now we can speak more clearly on it. So. Salamat po. Sorry that it was really, really choppy. I also want to really thank uh, Brutus Filipinas, which has like been a really, really deep resource uh, on, on a lot of these materials. Like I'm not an uh, architectural <laughs> theorist by any means, um, but this really gets me excited to maybe further this research, uh, research and um, you know check them out on Instagram and they do have a, like a, a way of donating to them if you'd like to sort of help further research into the, this brutalist period of architecture. So thanks so much. Cool. Thank you, Christian. That was a, a really um, interesting, I'm like almost like left with so many questions and like ideas and like this like intersection or like these like touching points of like the, the sort of like our past histories, both like recent past, but then also like further past. And then like the contemporary and like kind of like what the future holds, like especially that last photo that you showed, you know, in some ways like this vernacular collapsing into like this almost like Filipino street wear and like what that sort of means. Um, but I don't know, Marie, do we have any questions that came from in, in the chat? Yeah, we do. Um... So here's one. Uh, the question is, the common criticism of brutalism is that it dampens the human spirit. Um, can you speak about how you see people existing in the brutalist spaces around you in the Philippines? And, uh, yeah. I think, I think that it has that same feeling here. I think that for many years, um, I think like even like architects I spoke, I remember like I was like really interested in an, an architect fence is like, that building like why like I think it like yeah I think it has the same for the most part the same kind of feeling here is that it sort of it is very like in inhumane in many ways and oppressive and I think um, um, it, it really was about sort of I feel like for me like the, the Marcoses and martial law wasn't just them too as well I should mention that like there was a whole um, allyship of different oligarchs cronies families that sort of benefited from their favor. Um, and um, for me, it's like sort of them attaching themselves as sort of like, it's their own little mini versions of the CCP or like, but based upon their industry. Um, and so I think it, it really is oppressive, but I think only in recent times, I think maybe enough distance has um, uh, occurred um, that there's been a, like, a, like a sort of appreciation for the buildings and I feel like it's kind of, um, it's tenuous. On one, there's like, you know, people like me that just are really fascinated with them. But some, there's a sort of nostalgia for martial law. I mean, he won by 60% um, of the vote. And um, <clears throat> it wasn't just all, um, there was also a lot of middle-class, upper-class people who, who wanted that. He collaborated with the, the same families, the same families are here. And so I think they even have their own nostalgia for that time. And so for them, it's like when their grandfather had a kind of power or like, like the, you know, all, that, all that perception that the Marcoses were sort of creating through their propaganda about being this like world power, like it kind of harkens to that. And I wanted to include the section at the end called like soft brutalism. And there's a sort of resurgence of a kind of, um, the, within the interiors, like this kind of soft, brutalist look, but it's pink. It's like millennial pink. It's like the, they're referencing the logo, but they make it just slightly softer. It's like, like, like they took a brutalist, basically it's like a brutalist as, brutalism as a, like a, <laughs> a cake and they poured frosting over it or something. 
Um, <clears throat> but I didn't quit it because I, I, I didn't, it kind of felt mean spirited. Because I think like on one end, maybe some people just like the look and they got fooled into it, but also maybe some, it is a sort of um, make America great again type, golden age type, fascist longing for, you know, a conservative past. Um, so um, I feel like I need to do more research if I can have fairly um, assess that. So I feel like to assess the, I guess, so the answer to that question, I guess it's like a bit mixed. Like, I think there's a resurgence that's really interesting that's sort of remixing it. Um, but then again, I think, but on the, on the everyday scale, the average person, I think they still find it very oppressive and, and opposing. But whenever I walk into that area of, of Manila, Lagospi, and it's all, it's like almost like every building is, it's so pervasive, the brutalist style there. Like, I love it. I don't know what it is. Like, I feel like I'm at Machu Picchu or like, or the pyramids for me. Like for me, before it felt like the skeletons of this, this dead beast. But now that it's maybe potentially arising again, I have this other, other feeling of it. I am sort of feeling the, the more oppressive qualities. Um, I do have I do have one kind of quick question, and I think it, if nothing else like pops up in the chat, we can kind of wrap it up. But you you kind of touched on it a little bit like throughout the lecture in multiple ways. But you know, like, is there anything that's like happening at the edge or like the periphery of this like interaction between this like sort of new liberalism, like this sort of like weaponization of like of culture through architecture? But then something that's like more indigenous or like a more authentic sort of architecture, like are there these like kind of friction points like within the sort of like urban like or like cityscape? Or is it a sort of like uh, more of like an equal kind of like blending? Like what, what do these like touching points, you know, sort of like look like or like the energy or like the businesses or the culture around them? I think it's hard because in particular here, um, uh, there are, we don't really have a, it's it's actually a lot about how Manila was planned reminds me of LA, but there's not a lot of public works. There's not a lot of big, there's not a big public park. With LA, the big public work is the freeway, right? There isn't really anywhere you go like that. It's it's mainly privatized, right? So here it's kind of a similar way where especially post Marcos, like it wasn't all roses either. I think uh, in that power vacuum, uh, <clears throat> a lot of private enterprise came in and sucked up like all the all of the territories in the land and, and so it's sort of the shopping malls here that are, are this weird it become they become this weird edge and in, in the beginning it was like typical um shopping malls that are trying to you know just about commerce but now they're actually incorporating park areas like there's this mall here that they have a river walk and um so it's really interesting like seeing like maybe um these different uh, property conglomerates are the ones, or these literally these families are the ones that are supposed to be maybe being put on the edge, but it's largely driven by by commerce um, and by like uh, you know making business essentially. Um, like there are these like particular like I guess there's that kind of new urban structure where they make a mall and then they build um, residences around the mall. I feel like they, they started that in LA with like the, the, the Grove. I think that was like one of the first experiments in that. And, and then I think in Florida, there was a few of these and we have the same things here. My mom lives in one called Rockwell. There's, there's this power plant mall in the center. And then there's all these like high rises catering predominantly to um, actually quite a lot of expats as they call them or, um, or foreigners as they're called, basically, you know, immigrants. <laughs> I wish they just called them immigrants like everyone else, but um, uh, yeah, a lot of international immigrants here, and so it kind of caters to like an international class, and it is much more bougie. Um, and um, but I, I, but but I so the, it's on that end. Like it's very very commerce, very neoliberal, very much like driven by like uh, making dollars and like repurposing old land to to do that. And they're making these new cities all over that are like that. Um, but actually in a way like trying to create like a new urbanism, like trying to be bike friendly, they're trying to have like um, electric grid, solar power. So it's like, it's not all bad. I think like, not, I shouldn't be so flatting to say like all big business is, is bad, but it's just, that's more the case here than 
than, um, than government, I would say. Um, but I have to say, I am working potentially on this proposal with AYA um, on a, with the city of Pasig. Um, it's, we're literally still meeting about it now, but this is a city that they're known because they, the, the, the main river in Manila is named after the city. Um, and so there's like a big um, uh, cleanup. The, ri the river is completely toxic and filthy uh, in, in, in many areas, some areas it's okay. Um, so there's, there's this huge dredging of cleaning up of the rivers and through that maybe potentially um, making river walkways, maybe that would be the green spaces, like almost like um, if you're in New York, like the East River Parkway or many other of these like sort of like um, urban green projects. I, I, can't say there's many there's many of those but like, you know like the high line is one right like they like repurpose that their way into a garden so I have hopes that um, because Pasig is run by a more progressive mayor who's super young he's like 38 I got to meet him the other day Vico Soto and like I'm like it's just crazy like just think that you're older than the mayor <laughs> and um, uh, so or is he 38 or 28 he's super young i mean it really felt like i was hanging i mean shouldn't say anything too loud but yeah it was very um very interesting meeting him and also very a very very open guy and seemed very open to ideas so i think that um working with these architects who are more progressive who who really their thesis even in showing you that that development project Busai, which is kind of like i mentioned to you like a kind of way of taking um private development but using it as a way of like um having a, some sort of public space. Um, but now instead of working with a private developer, maybe with the city government could be really, really interesting. So I will have to check back in on that. Um, but yeah, I think definitely there's there's some some hybrid in the mix, but at the moment, like no clear examples because um, working with local government here is very, very difficult and very, very um, complicated. Um, yeah, but that's another story. Cool. Um, well, again, Christian, it was, it was an honor. It was, um, again, fascinating talk and, um, you know, we really enjoyed it. Um, and it was like, interesting, again, to get a peek into like this history and the development, um, from like a graphic design, but also architectural lens, like really like addressing culture, um, and, and like how that impacts and affects communities and politics. Um, so yeah, it was great. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And like, sorry if it was like a bit more rough and, um, <laughs> but no, I. Uh, no, it was exactly yeah, as it, it, as it should be. It was fun. What's that? I said it was exactly as it should be. It's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you everyone who, who's in the, who's joined and st stuck around. And uh, yeah, if anyone has other questions. Oh, yeah, sorry, someone has something to say. Oh, I was just going to say thank you. This was awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Is the, uh, do you know if that um, exhibit is still up at the Center for Book Arts? Yes, it's up there till I believe that uh, middle or end of June. So um, yeah, please check it out. There's like a lot of other different, it's about research-based practices. So um, yeah, it's very, very, very interesting. And, and the, that print, uh, there's prints of that, um, that poster that we, we commissioned are there for free there. So I get a free print. <laughs> awesome, I'm gonna check it out. Awesome, thank you. Um, All right, yeah, thanks, thanks Charles. And um, yeah, like, I don't know, if anyone has other questions, like um, I'm on Instagram <laughs> all the time. Yeah, it's awesome, it's good. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. All right.